Okay, welcome to the second part. We are now going to um, look at the implementation of the entities language. In this diagram, you can see that it serves as the basis for all the extension experiments and composition experiments we're going to do. So entities is the uh, language that's that's at the center of it all. And we're going to, if you look at the class, sorry for the chaos here, but I can't do a full screen projection because then, um, Anyway, it doesn't work with recording. <laughs> so here is a kind of class diagram. We have at the top level, we have a module concept, which contains a, contains a bunch of entities, right? Entities and modules have names. Attributes are then contained in entities. Attributes also have names and they have a type. These are all containment hierarchies, so it's a tree. And then type itself is abstract and there are different types. There's Boolean type, int type, string type. And there is an entity type, which contains a different entity. So you can write things like, uh, a person has a car. So that acts as an overview. So let's go back to uh, MPS here and look at the entity sandbox. And we can look at the entity company, which is exactly what you've seen basically right here is a module. Here is an employee. It has a bunch of attributes. They have different types. And you can see here the entity type, which acts as a pointer to another entity, in this case, the department. Let's take a look at how this is implemented because we're going to see this or need this in, in a moment. In the previous part, I've shown you um, language concepts and stuff. So we can go back here, Control Shift S, sorry, it was too much. You can see the module, which contains entities, zero too many, right? The editor of a module is simply a vertical list. The first line contains module and the name and then indented the vertical list of entities, which is exactly what you see here, right? module, keyword, name, and then a vertical list of entities. Um, right, let's go back to the definition. Um, yeah, it contains entities, so we can go to entity. It uh, basically looks the same, right? It has a name, it, it extends base concept, like, like everything else, it doesn't extend anything, anything really. It has a bunch of attributes. Attributes also have names. <clears throat> attributes then have a type. And the type is interesting because it is abstract, right? And if we look at the hierarchy, you can see that we have Boolean type, int type, string type, and entity type. I I, I started, I, you know, called them E Boolean E for entity, you know, because we'll have other primitive types with the same name in other places. And it's extremely con confusing if they have the same name. The tool can obviously deal with it, but as humans, you guys, when you try to follow me, it's hard. That's why I um, prefix them with an E. Um, what's interesting here is um, deleting this stuff here or closing this stuff how the department type works right because it has to be a type object otherwise it doesn't fit into the slot here right I mean the entity in the attribute expects a type object and so entity type has to be a type as well we can control shift s here entity type extends type and then it references another entity. So here is something that's interesting. If I'm trying to enter a type, how does this work? I can press control space and I can see the primitive types that I can enter. As you can see for Boolean, I haven't customized it. So I really have to select E Boolean type and then it projects it as Boolean. That is of course extremely annoying. So I can go back to the Boolean type and go to the concept properties and enter an alias. And the alias in this case should probably be called Boolean. And once I've done that and rebuilt the language and waited for a second, <laughs> So going back here, um, if I delete the type and press control space again, now Boolean is projected this way and I can simply also type Boolean and enter it as expected. Anyway, the interesting thing is the department type because the department type is defined as something which extends type but refers to an existing entity. The system directly, when I press control space, shows me the possible targets for that reference. So. I have two entities here, employee and department, and I can select any of these. And once I select it, the system instantiates the um, entity type object and puts whatever I've selected into the entity reference. So in this way, these adapters, that's what they essentially are, it's a, an adapter between the type class 
which is expected here, and a department object, which I want to refer to. So something that extends type and points to department, access and adapter. And um, I, can, I can simply go and type department here as well, right? If I can type it and it binds as well. So very nice. So what else is there to say about this language? There is the type story, right? The whole attribute has a type because it has something in its type field. So we can take a look at that at this sorry at this uh, type calculation rule here. Got to get rid of this stuff here. So the type of the attribute is its type of its type. We've seen that in the last example. So nothing new here. Um, what else is there to say? here on this language. What is interesting is the code generator. We haven't looked at code generation so far at all. What we're doing here is we're generating Java code. We're generating a boring old Java bean from that entity. And because MPS comes with Java, we don't actually have to generate ASCII text. We can generate an instance of MPS's Java language. They call it base language, probably for trademarking uh, issue <laughs> reasons. And um, so we, we essentially we run a model to model transformation that creates um, a Java class with the usual getters and setters for an entity from our model element. So let's take a look at how this works. So in the langmod package, there is the entities language. Here are all the various uh, things we've just discussed, all these meta classes, concepts. Here are the type system rules, right? And um, we want to take a look at the generator. And generators consist of two building blocks. They consist of templates, which act as transformation rules between the source and the target, in this case, between our entities language and Java. And it contains mapping configurations. These are basically configuration files that tell the system which mapping with templates to execute. So if we look at this, we can basically see that a couple of things are done. One, there is a so-called root mapping rule that maps entity objects using the map entity template. And if you look at that guy, this looks like a Java class with a bunch of special stuff. And we're going to take a look at that in a second. Just let's continue with the mapping configuration. So in addition to mapping entities to these Java beans, um, there are also reduction rules for the primitive types. So an eint type, remember the eint type is the integer in our sorry go here in our entities language right so that guy is mapped to int which is if we look at that control shift s that is the integer type from the java language so we map our int to java's int we map our string to java's string and so on and so on not very uh, interesting this one is more interesting because we map the entity type to Something strange. We're going to take a look at that in, in, a, in a second. So let's first look at the mapping template for entities themselves. Here we go. Uh, that's this one. And what's important in MPS really is that, as I said, this is a, effectively a model-to-model -model transformation. So we map an entity input to a Java class. And because we run it as a model-to-model -model transformation, the class we generate has to be structurally correct. What I mean by that is that um, we can't just generate like half a class without a constructor or without the closing parentheses because MPS uses its own mechanisms to represent classes. In other words, this guy is a valid instance. I mean, this guy is a valid instance of Java base languages class concept. And so the way we templatify that is by adding so-called um, macros. So you can see here that this class has the name map entity. It's a stupid name because the name of the generated class should correspond to the name of the entity from which we generate. So in, in order for this to work, during code generation, we have to change the name of what's put here, which is basically some dummy word could be anything we change that using a so-called property macro to whatever this expression in the inspector returns and it returns node.name node is our input entity and name is obviously the name of that guy so this tool or this this approach maps or changes the name of the generated java class 
to the name of the entity. If we wanted to make this differently, we could call this, you know, like bean, right? Then our thing would be called, per, uh, what was it? Employee bean, department bean. We don't need that, but that, that's what, what we, we could do that. So then we want to generate a field for each of the um, attributes of our entity. So we first manually write a normal Java field here, and then we use the loop macro, looping over all the attributes of our input entity, and then replacing the int type, which we've put here and in the example field, with the type of the input node. In this case, the input node now is the attribute because that's what we kind of looped over. And therefore, uh, node.type returns the type of the attribute that we're currently looping over. Now, we don't want to put our entity languages int type here, but we want to put the corresponding Java type. And that's interesting because this copy source macro, which basically replaces whatever it's wrapped around with whatever this returns, it also executes on the fly these reduction rules we've seen before. So it, it kind of encounters an int, an e int type in the type field of the attribute we're currently iterating over, but it replaces it with Java int, or in case of the string, with a Java string and so on. So this way, this guy is going to be whatever the uh, entity types map to. And that guy is again one of these property macros, right? So it's not called a field, it's going to be the name of the property. So this way we generate um, the, the private members. And then basically the setters and getters work the same way, right? We use uh, a property macro to change the name. We use a method called setter name. It's a helper method that we've associated with attribute. Attributes can also, or any meta classes, concepts can also have kind of behavior methods. And in this case, we simply generate or calculate set and then the first name of first character of the attributes name with capitalized and so on. So the usual convention. That placeholder stuff you should ignore. We're going to take a look at that later when we talk about language composition. And then I guess the, the, the content is clear. Basically, we assign the new value that comes in here in the setter to the field. Notice that the, we don't have to put another macro around the a field here, which references that private guy, because we iterate over the same collection. Here we iterate over all the attributes. Here we iterate over the attributes. And then in that case, it kind of automatically uses the right one here. And uh, finally, well, the setter works the same way. Not much to add, I guess. And then we have the uh, to string method, which basically dumps the thing um, so that it's uh, nicely understandable when we output um, an entity. Right. So this is all I wanted to show. Um, I should be able to run this. So let's go here. Let's go. Sorry. Let's go to our entity sandbox and um, um, generate that. I'm going to use the preview generate text thing. And um, oh, it, it ran. Uh, one second. Company DB base adapter. We need the, for example, employee dot Java, right? So that's one of those beans. So here is the employee. It has all these uh, primitive members. It has setters and getters. Again, please ignore the uh, RBAC thing. That is already a consequence of the fact that we have this uh, language composition employed here. So basically, we have the, the assignment of the new value. And uh, here we have somewhere the getters. And we have the generated to string method that nicely outputs all the fields. Okay, so that was the entities language, which acts as the base for all the subsequent extensions. So at this point, I want to finish with this part, and I'm going to come back to this point in the next part, in uh, whenever you started, a couple of seconds, I guess.